thank you uh, thank you agnivesh for the very kind introduction and thank you dr siddharth yadav for having me for this uh, teaching session so my talk for today is uh, is cervical spondylotic myelopathy and uh, let me just set myself up yeah so uh okay so so about cervical myelopathy uh this i mean as you all know uh, age related changes uh, are inevitable in the cervical spine uh, the problem is uh, the elderly people not only they are expected to be old but they are also expected to act old as well so many times what happens is that these clinical features of uh, cervical myelopathy in the elderly gets uh, labeled as uh, senescence or the fact that this person is old and that's why the patient's physical ability are are decreasing so uh, it, it is sometimes hard to diagnose cervical myelopathy in in, in the very elderly patients uh, even though the most common reason for myelopathy above the age of uh, 50 is cervical spondylotic myelopathy so with that there is this new definition now uh, or uh, a concept that has been proposed of degenerative cervical myelopathy which is a broad umbrella diagnosis which includes cervical spondylotic myelopathy and also includes other uh pathologies that not necessarily are degenerative uh but uh, they may have some genetic basis to it but may also have a degenerative phenomenon added to it like opll and olf but today's uh, talk is going to be more focused on the cervical spondylotic myelopathy which is the the one that is much more common so the pathophysiology of uh, cervical myelopathy uh, there are two aspects to it one is the static insult to the spinal cord and the other one is the dynamic insult and what a common pathway of these two is the disruption of the musculature of the spinal cord and damage to the parenchyma of the uh, spinal cord including the gray matter and white matter tracts which causes over a period of time a permanent change Uh, in the function of the spinal cord so the static factors are the mechanical factors which are uh, as a consequence of degeneration oops did i are you able to see my screen uh, no it's a gray Hello? screen sir and it's a screen which is grayed out oh wait a minute suddenly something crashed ha huh, now yeah. yeah yeah i can see now are you able to see yeah so yeah some see? problem at yes. my end are you able to see now yes it's clear now yeah so uh, the static mechanical factors are the usual degenerative uh, uh, de uh, phenomenons that happen as a consequence of disc degeneration and facetal hypertrophy includes these hard osteophytes at the edges of the end plates uh, the ligamentum flavum hypertrophy and the uncle osteo uh, osteophytes at the ligament of lushka so all these things uh, narrow the space available for the spinal cord as well as for the nerve root but the problem also is that the cervical spine is a mobile structure and with every flexion and extension the diameter of the spinal canal changes and not only the diameter of the spinal canal changes the spinal cord gets stretched like a rubber band over this uh, bumps if you want to call them so imagine the spinal cord as an elastic rubber band uh, which has uh, which has been pinched at multiple places so every time it the person moves the the neck uh the the spinal cord gets uh, trapped in these osteophytes and the buccal ligamentum flavum and that it also contributes a lot uh to the damage to the spinal cord substance so you can see in this patient on an extension mri uh 
uh, how narrow the spinal canal is and on flexion uh, it opens up a little bit with an with a spondylolisthesis that you can notice at uh, l c3 and c4 and c5 so again spondylolisthesis also much more uncommon than in the lumbar spine but it does occur and sometimes these are mobile and cause a pincer effect on the on the spinal cord so the common final pathway for these mechanical compressions is the spinal cord ischemia that can happen because if it is compressed all these blood vessels that enter the spinal cord parenchyma are end arteries so prolonged compression uh, is going to cause ischemia as well as physical pressure on the uh, white matter tracts and the gray matter causes the damage to them and over a period of time this becomes irreversible the most common clinical features of uh, this disease is a gait abnormality or loss of manual dexterity so you would find these two are the most early signs of of cervical spondylotic myelopathy as the myelopathy progresses you can have weakness and paresthesias actual demonstrable motor deficits uh, very rarely bladder symptoms towards the uh, end and all this neurological syndrome can be associated with axial neck pain and sometimes radiculopathy uh, which you can call it as myelo radiculopathy so it's a combination of upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron problem so classical gait pattern uh, of myelopathy is a myelopathic gait which is a white based gait which has a very staggering quality to it and it it is like a person who is drunk if you have seen a person who is drunk and walking see as a white based staggering tends to fall and patients with early myelopathic tell that they haven't had anything to drink but they still feel as if they are drunk that's a very typical symptom of early myelopathy and if you have a patient who is not so obviously myelopathic like this you can make the patient walk in a tandem fashion like a heel to toe gait like this photograph here and uh, uh, early myelopathics won't be able to walk like this especially the younger ones the elderly ones you have to be aware that many elderly people uh, because of other problems may not be able to walk a tandem gait even if they don't have myelopathy so you have to interpret that sign with caution because that's not always the case in in uh, uh, elderly people so an 80 year old patient you may you, you should not expect them that they will be able to do a good tandem walk so then is the this is the romberg's uh, sign and the romberg's that the spelling mistake r o m romberg sign is uh, a sign of a, a posterior column dysfunction or sometimes it can be seen in patients with severe peripheral um, neuropathy who have a loss of proprioception so romberg sign is not a sign of cerebellar dysfunction as you all know you ask the patient to close his eyes um, and you eliminate that visual cue that the cerebellum is getting and because the eyes are gone and the patient's posterior column sense uh, sensory proprioception is affected just the ear is not able to balance uh, the person uh, with just one input from the ear so the person sways or sometimes falls so this is a classical romberg sign in this patient and as we discussed before one of the earliest signs is the loss of manual dexterity of these patients they are not able to do fine things with their hands and fingers and you ask them they are their handwriting has changed they are not able to hold their pen properly and you know the banks refuse their checks because their signature no longer appears the same uh, these two patients are quite severe you can see they are struggling to uh, this actually is an exercise uh, of, of for myelopathy hand for them to recover post uh, surgery but uh, patients would complain of difficulty buttoning their clothes and you know doing fine things with their fingers so that's a very early sign of uh, of um, cervical myelopathy so this is a finger escape sign uh, a sign of myelopathy hand where you ask the patient to stretch out uh, their arms and keep all their fingers adducted and they are they are not able to keep their ulnar fingers adducted so after some time the ulnar li li little finger and the, sometimes the ring finger starts abducting 
and flexing. The more severe the myelopathy hands, the more the fingers are involved. So this is called the finger escape sign. Another sign is the grip release uh, where your rapidity in which you can grip and release is, is slow. Uh, and, and a lot of patients would have uh, hypertonia and spasticity. Like you can see this patient has a lower extremity spasticity where you suddenly flex uh, the knee joint and the, ankle, uh, the heel goes off the bed. In a normal person who has normal tone or hypotonia, the heel will stay on the heel will stay on the bed. So in this patient, you can see that the heel is uh, he, it is going off the bed. So that is a sign of spasticity, and spasticity is velocity dependent, and that's why you need to do this rapidly. So when you do it rapidly, the muscle uh, because its tone is increased, with tone is the resting state of a muscle, it will it will resist. Uh, that flexion and that's why the heel will go up. So that's hypertonia or spasticity. Obviously the deep tendon reflexes may be exaggerated for an upper motor neuron lesion like in this patient who has brisk biceps, triceps and brachioradialis reflex and uh, um, uh, uh, in this patient you, you, if, if all of these are exaggerated then your localization goes above the C5 because the biceps root value is C5. That patient actually had a C3, C4 disc herniation. This is the finger flexion reflex. You put your, your fingers on the patient's uh, fingers and tap them, you will find that the fingers contract. This finger flexion reflex is C8 nerve root. You can see that finger flexion reflex even in the brachioradialis reflex here. Uh, you can see as you tap the brachioradialis, you will see the fingers flexing. Yeah, so you, when you see, see the fingers also flex. So uh, what is happening is that the, when you are stimulating the brachioradialis, all the segments below the C6 level are also stimulated. And that's why your C8 is also hyper in this patient. So that's, this is the same patient. So that's why you're getting this. Now Hoffman's reflex is Another sign of myelopathy, it's seen more commonly in myelopathic patients, but it is also seen in normal people. So by itself, Hoffman reflex is not uh, indicative of myelopathy. If it is seen in isolation, Hoffman reflex has to be associated with other signs and symptoms of myelopathy for it to have some value. And we'll see uh, the, the statistics behind it. This is the same patient with an ankle clonus Again, the one who was uh, had spasticity. And this is Babinski. So clonus and Babinski are, are very important. And if you have clonus and Babinski, it is almost certain that this person has involvement of corticospinal tracts uh, uh, like that. And this is an Oppenheim's in the same patient. Uh, Oppenheim's is not, not a very sensitive uh, test. So it's not done very commonly. Uh, Babinski is the true test. So Lormite sign, typically described for multiple sclerosis uh, uh, as uh, electric shock-like sensations in the arms and legs when the neck is flexed. Uh, but in cervical myelopathy, you many times would find that the patient complain of a reverse lermite. It means they have that electric shock-like sensation or numbness on an extension uh, of the neck. Like they try to drink water or try to swallow a pill and when they are doing that, they get these sensations in their arms so and legs. So that is a very huh? typical, that's a typical extension Lermite sign seen in uh, uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy. So this is a very interesting paper by John Ree, uh, is published in Spine 2009. So what these guys did is that they compared 39 cervical myelopathy patients, proven cervical myelopathy, correlating symptoms with the MRIs with 37 normal people with normal MRIs. And you can see the interesting thing in this is that the cervical myelopathy patients, about 20% of patients have no myelopathy signs. So one in five patients with cervical myelopathy will not have any hyperreflexia, clonus, Babinski, Hoffman, or any of the myelopathy signs that we just saw in those videos. So um, which also means that not 
every patient with cervical myelopathy is going to present with the full spectrum of uh, of signs so the way to diagnose cervical myelopathy is to correlate the imaging with the symptoms and the signs are corroborated so if you look at the controls normal people about 57% that's about 60% of patients at least have one myelopathy sign which means having hyperreflexia or hoffman 16% of normal people had hoffman's reflex about 57% of normal people had at least one reflex that was hyper so hyperreflexia is is something can happen normally to anxious patients hoffman can be seen in normal people but what is not seen in normal people are these two zero percents are the babinski and clonus so if you have babinski and clonus babinski and clonus is is purely pathological if you have something like that it clinches the corticospinal tract involvement but isolated hyperreflexia isolated hoffmans isolated um, inverted brachioradialis reflex is not necessarily has to be myelopathy so you have to correlate that with the clinical presentation and why understanding this is very important is that cervical myelopathy is masquerades as a a big spectrum of neurological disorders uh, that can appear very very similar to uh, cervical myelopathy we recently had a patient who was referred to us to the orthopedic department for surgery by the neurologist because the patient's mri had uh, cervical stenosis and the patient had a dysfunction of the hand and the patient had uh, gait abnormalities uh, and when the patient came to us there was something odd about the patient patient said that uh, uh, in the past 6 months i have finding it difficult to speak um, i have dysarthria and I'm, i'm my tongue is rolling in my uh, in my mouth and uh, when we examined there were fasciculations in the deltoid uh, absent reflexes everywhere so something odd was going on and obviously this patient came 6 months after the neurologist had examined him because of the covid lockdown and then we sent the patient back to the neurologist that something else has happened in this last 6 months and your your examination findings uh, things have added on to it so then when they saw it they said yes yes this is uh, this is uh, als this is not Uh, cervical myelopathy and so see how easily you can make out uh, make a difference uh, or make a mistake between uh, having cervical spondylotic myelopathy and motor neuron disease because a lot of elderly people are going to have asymptomatic cervical stenosis so unless you suspect that there are there could be other diseases also which can mimic uh, a gait abnormality or hand dysfunction Uh, uh you will miss all these findings and that's why it's very important to have help uh if you have any doubt in the diagnosis or if things are not fitting in or if you are not very confident of your neurological examination your neurological colleagues are 100 times better at examining and taking a history of a patient uh, than orthopedic residents and orthopedic uh, surgeons uh, sadly we need to cultivate this uh, skill which the neurologists have so there is no shame in asking for an opinion especially if you are going to offer this patient surgery so you will be surprised how many times uh, they will pick up an odd diagnosis uh, actually there are some interesting papers on this and uh, there is one paper out of uk where they retrospectively looked at lo all their als or motor neuron diagnosis patients and they found that about 20% of their ALS patients had at least one unnecessary surgery done in the last 10 years thinking that there was something else before their diagnosis of motor neuron disease was made like you know having tkrs done and having cervical laminectomies done for cervical stenosis when all this all the time those patients had ALS so that's uh, a very interesting and eye opening uh, literature that you will find so message is that take help if you have any doubt uh, regarding the diagnosis uh, especially if you are operating uh, such patients uh, the disability of these uh, patients is uh, uh, quantified by the neuric disability score uh, it's there in all textbooks so i won't go into that 
what what is more commonly used is the modified JOA score, uh, the Japanese Orthopedic Association score, and uh, this is a good way of quantifying uh, the severity of the myelopathy, uh, where 15 to 17 score is mild, and above or lower than that is moderate, and severe is zero to 10. So this is a, a way to judge how severe the myelopathy uh, is. So the investigations essentially come down to x-rays and MRIs. Uh, those are the investigations that you will ask for. Uh, CTs are rare, uh, but sometimes CTs with myelograms are necessary. And we'll see that. Uh, MRIs are T1-weighted and T2-weighted sagittal images. Uh, you will see uh, where the location of the uh, stenosis is, anterior or posterior, how the spinal cord is, and how the signal is there in the spinal cord. But the, the, the true quantification of the stenosis instead of the sagittal is on the actual images. So on actual images at every level, you have to see how narrow the spinal canal is um, um, uh, compared to normal adjacent levels. And if you uh, calculate the ratios of the anterior posterior and the lateral diameters, if, if this ratio is less than 0 0.4, uh, that's a bad prognosis. The more severe the compression, the it has been shown that uh, the and and the longer the compression it has been shown that the cord permanently gets atrophic in spite of doing a decompression the cord remains a uh, smaller diameter especially if it is very chronic not always true but actual images are the ones where you see the severity of compression uh, has signal change in the spinal cord is a controversial thing a lot of people give a lot of importance to this uh, saying that, okay, if you have a signal change in your spinal cord, it means a bad prognosis that you will not recover or you will recover partially, or the fact that having a signal in your spinal cord means that you need to get operated no matter what your symptoms are. And there is not much truth in this, I think. Uh, signal change in the spinal cord can happen because of a host of uh, pathologies that are happening at the cellular level. It can range from as benign as having some edema and a break in the blood spinal cord barrier to much more severe scarring of the spinal cord with cystic changes and myelomalacia and things like that. So not necessary all signal changes in the spinal cord means something bad is happening to it. But yes, uh, it does mean that uh, there is a pathological change that is happening in the spinal cord. If your signal change is well demarcated it generally means a bad prognosis, means it is more chronic and scarred down. If you have a multi-segment high signal change, again, it correlates with a, a poor prognosis in terms of recovery post-surgery. Uh, another thing is whenever you have a bright signal in, your, uh, in, in the T2-weighted sequences, always look at the T1-weighted sequences. If the T1-weighted sequence at the same region shows a dark patch or a hypo-intense patch, uh, means that the signal uh, change is secondary to scarring or cystic change. Any scar tissue or cyst will appear even darker on the T1-weighted uh, image. So that, again, indicates a poorer prognosis in terms of post-operative recovery of, of the uh, spinal cord function. Uh, X-rays essentially are to look at the spinal alignment uh, and also to look at uh, whether the canal is... Uh, developmentally narrow or not. You can see these two examples. There is a dramatic difference between the uh, spinal canal in the second patient, which has a very wide spinal canal, versus this patient who has a narrower spinal canal. You see this gap here is such narrow. That's the lamina, laminar shadow on the lateral view. So that's the spinous process. That's the lamina, and that's the edge of the lateral mass. You can see how shallow the lamina is here and how tall the lamina is here. And, and this patient has a very wide uh, spinal canal and patients with developmentally narrow canal tend to have multi-level stenosis because they are born with a small room for the spinal cord. And as uh, the stenosis uh, accumulates or the degenerative changes accumulate in the cervical spine with time, uh, it compromises the spinal cord. So if you have to eyeball it, you can eyeball it by just trying to fit the vertebral body into the spinal canal. 
so generally you are able to fit the vertebral body into the spinal canal and that's sufficient that's not a developmentally narrow canal so if you have a narrow canal you will not be able to fit the vertebral body into the spinal canal which also means the pavlos ratio is less than 1 normally it is kind of 1 is to 1 or a little bit more but if your spinal canal is is smaller than your pavlos ratio is going to get reversed or is going to look be lesser than 1 another useful thing in the cervical spine is the alignment so you get the sitting x rays um, and see what the neutral alignment of the cervical spine is and you can see in this patient the alignment is is slightly kyphotic the moment you see abnormalities in alignment of the cervical spine you your next investigation is a flexion extension x ray a voluntary flexion extension x ray to see whether that mal alignment is correcting or not so you can see this patient has neutral position has a slightly kyphotic spine but in a extension position it is uh, is the lordosis is restored uh, quite nicely and this has implications on treatment when you are going to choose surgeries for these patients so a patient presenting with a relatively kyphotic spine or or spondylolisthesis for that matter you are going to get a flexion extension x ray just to see what uh is there a dynamic nature to that deformity or not and how you can correct it so uh, the kyphosis or effective kyphosis you can judge by drawing a line from the the posterior inferior corner of c2 to the c7 and and you see this line if most of your vertebral bodies the back of your vertebral bodies are lying behind this then that's a effective kyphosis which means that the spinal cord is draped over these bumps at every level and and again remember that this is dynamic and and it causes uh, um, uh, the uh, compression uh, uh, because of this deformity and and the fact that when you do a posterior surgery the spinal cord is not going to move away from these anterior compression structures so this is an example of a flexion extension x ray done for a patient with a spondylolisthesis at like a step ladder spine at multiple levels you can see the spondylolisthesis here and in the flexion all the spondylolisthesis is increasing not only that his kyphosis is also increasing in flexion and in extension it is slightly reducing and then this patient in surgery we were able to get correction of all the spondylolisthesis with instrumentation and an extension position after doing the facetal releases so another thing that you can pick up on x rays are these abnormal ossifications that a good good quality x ray will show you like this this patient has an ossification of the all here and also has an ossific shadow here at the back of the vertebral bodies which is ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament or the opll so this is again very uh, important sign to pick up uh because if you uh, enter the anterior part of the cervical spine here trying to decompress this without knowing that this is opll you are going to get in a big trouble because to decompress such large opll from the anterior approach is quite dangerous and it's quite technically demanding procedure not very easy to do uh, and most people for something like this would choose a posterior approach uh because it's so hard to remove this opll another clue on mris is that if you see the t2 weighted images and the t1 weighted images of the same patient you can see how dark the disc appears so if you if you mistake this as a soft disc herniation you'll make a big error because at c34 level this apparently disc like looking lesion is as dark on the t1 weighted image as well so the thing that appears so dark on on the t1 weighted image as well as a t2 weighted image is bone it's cortical bone so in the on the mri very few things appear so dark air appears so dark so you can see the air in the trachea is going to appear dark whatever is very calcified and very fibrotic is going to appear dark so uh you will see the cortical boundaries will appear dark on on t1 weighted images so if you find a disc that is like this then it's not a disc it's an opll and be careful you should get a ct scan and 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 confirm that 
that that's an OPLL, especially if you are going to do an anterior surgery, because that's a dangerous thing to to uh, to get into and and from an anterior approach without knowing. So that's the usefulness of a CT scan. CT myelography is rare, useful for patients who have a contraindication for MRI. And in, in some situations like severe deformities, I find it useful. Or sometimes if you have these metal plates and you have adjacent segment stenosis and the MRI has a lot of artifact, then uh, you, know, you can use CT myelograms to detect but it's an invasive thing. So it's not very common uh, investigation. A plain CT is much more common. Electrophysiological studies, again, are usually done to rule out confounding diseases. You can have severe peripheral neuropathy and have Rombox positive and have uh, uh, ataxic sensory ataxia. You, as we have seen, ALS would also present or MS would present like myelopathy. So uh, if you have confounding diseases, many times the neurologist will ask for all these electrophysiological studies. But electrophysiological studies are not used to rule in cervical myelopathy. It is used to rule out other diseases. Rarely these SACPs and all we use for asymptomatic cervical stenosis to help us make a decision whether somebody should be offered surgery or not. Because we don't really understand the natural history so well because apart from the studies that were done several decades ago, there's never going to be a natural history study for cervical spinal cord compression. You're not going to keep watching patients who with moderate or severe deficits to see what is happening to them. So overall, what we know is that most people will deteriorate over time, uh, but most for most people, the deterioration is slow over three to six years, and it is in a gradual step ladder fashion acute sudden deteriorations in cervical myelopathy are quite rare unless they are associated with an accident or a trauma on top of having a, a spinal stenosis. Now, sometimes you have patients with asymptomatic stenosis. That means you find they have uh, MRIs that uh, have severe spinal cord compression, but they have no myelopathy, they have no dysfunction. Uh, so what do you do with them? So this part is a bit controversial the natural history studies for these patients show that about 8% of patients would end up requiring surgery at one year and about quarter of them would end up requiring surgery because they become symptomatic at the end of four years. So, so that's what happens uh, to them, but it's not necessary that you have to offer them surgery at get go depends on their uh, many factors. And some people have looked at these factors uh, some people say that, you know, if you have an EMG abnormality of radiculopathy, then maybe they have a higher chance of deterioration, which makes no sense to me at all. The SACP being abnormal makes sense because if you have an abnormal SACP already uh, and you are, say, 40 year old or 50 year old and you have 30 more years to live, then it makes sense that, you know, you are, you are sitting on a, on a potential problem that can progressively damage the spinal cord. But we don't really know whether having a hypermobile cervical spine or an existing cervical uh, or existing signal intensity change in the cord would make a difference. Or having uh, like, you know, we don't really know how to interpret DTIs or diffusion tensor imaging yet. But maybe as evidence uh, uh, and better imaging comes along, we'll be able to better predict who is going to do badly and offer those people surgery versus you know, uh, patients who are going to remain stable for a really long period of time or for the rest of their lives. And so we would be able to exclude them from offering any surgical treatment. So non-operative treatment for, for this problem is very rare. It's, there is no real non-operative treatment for cervical myelopathy. As we discussed for asymptomatic stenosis, you can offer non-operative treatment, especially for patients who are in the older age group who have stenosis, uh, uh, sorry, comorbidities, and who have maybe a lifespan of 10 years or 20, 15 years. For them, you don't really have to do uh, surgical treatment, but you know, a 40 year old or a 45 year old with an asymptomatic cervical stenosis, especially if it is quite severe with abnormalities in SSCP, uh, you may have to think twice. I mean, you still have to do a shared decision-making with the patient and it's no longer a unilateral decision uh, as it is with uh, moderate or severe myelopathies. Uh, 
so mild myelopathy is again depending on the situation you can conserve and watch them because a lot of mild myelopathics especially very elderly patients might remain mild myelopathics for the rest of their lives without undergoing surgery obviously you will tell them to avoid falls and uh, involve in risky behavior especially the younger ones who have these problems and explain to them the warning symptoms and if they do develop them then come back to you for examination so for the surgical treatment essentially you have these three options anterior posterior and circumferential and we are going to stick to fusion and not get into controversy of motion preserving disc replacements and all but essentially these are decompressive surgeries either non fusion surgeries like laminectomy or laminoplasties or fusion surgeries like anterior fusions or posterior fusions but the problem is that <coughs> these radiological compressions of cervical myelopathy are quite varied no two patients are similar and their configurations of stenosis are going to be different for each and every patient as 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 each and every patient is different from the medical and other comorbidity standpoint so you still have to make a decision on, on what type of surgery are you going to offer a patient and a lot of it depends on the patho anatomy of the problem whether the compression is because of a soft disc herniation which is quite rare uh, a soft disc herniation is much more common in the lumbar spine in the cervical spine it's not that common it tends to happen in younger people um, and that may be a cause of cervical myelopathy definitely a cause of cervical radiculopathy uh, but a soft disc herniation cervical radiculopathy tend to be self limiting but for myelopathics it's a different matter uh, sometimes hard osteophytes which is the usual cervical spondylotic myelopathy is the cause of of compression or whether it's an opll location of compression is important whether it is anterior or posterior or it is circumferential how many levels are involved 1 2 3 4 what is the alignment of the cervical spine kyphotic straight or lordotic is there any focal instability like spondylolisthesis or has the patient been operated before already and the patient has has getting uh, uh decompensation and further uh, new symptoms after a decompression from the first surgery so those are all issues that you will have to think about uh in patho anatomy and for a patient uh, a lot depends on what you are able to do in these elderly population especially if they have a lot of comorbidities osteoporosis is going to affect your fixation so that may make a that may be involved in your decision making smoking affects uh, fusion rates so you may choose a non fusion surgery more in patients who are heavily smokers and body habitus also ma matters if you have a very short neck and a bulky neck and you don't have an access uh, anteriorly you might choose to do a posterior surgery and lastly is the surgeon and the surgeon's experience and preference and this is also very important because not all surgeons have, have the same uh, level of uh, comfort with with certain approaches now most most people are comfortable with the posterior approaches but when it comes to anterior approaches especially a high cervical or low cervical or multi level uh, decompressions uh, it depends on uh, on your experience and your comfort level so uh, considering both anterior and posterior surgeries work equally well uh, some surgeons just because of their preference would choose a posterior surgery over an anterior surgery and that's perfectly okay uh, to do that uh, uh, for the patients who are somewhere in between like the three levels or or sometimes the two levels in difficult scenarios so Uh, so that's a very important factor also to remember that you can't be hard pressed and be adamant that no matter what i am going to do an anterior surgery and it it does not matter whatever else it doesn't matter so that's not really uh, a good way of thinking about it so this was a paper that we had published on it but uh, but essentially uh, when you are choosing an anterior versus posterior surgery the principles are these the anterior procedures are direct decompressions it it does not destabilize the spine uh, it is actually restoring the deformity and you are not manipulating the spinal cord or you are not you are not getting into the you are not staring at the dura before you are looking at the compression you are decompressing the compression compression directly so that's 
that's important not that it makes a difference direct and indirect decompressions have been shown to be equally effective in terms of uh, post operative neurological recovery posterior is indirect decompression which means it depends on the ability of the spinal cord to move away from the anterior compression and for that it requires a, a lordotic cervical spine and it is a destabilizing surgery because uh cervical spine does not behave like the lumbar spine where in lumbar spine you have 80% of the load going anteriorly and 20% going posteriorly that's not the case with cervical spine in cervical spine it's 50 50 is anterior 50 is posterior so so the posterior tension band made up of the lamina and the posterior uh, muscles and the ligaments that are attached to the spinous processes and lamina is an important structure that is holding the cervical spine uh, the way it is and and doing a laminectomy is a destabilizing uh, is is a destabilizing surgery so the problem with the anterior approach is that it starts getting morbid the moment you start doing surgeries three or more levels the more you stay in the anterior uh, space and keep retracting the viscera and the structures around there the more problem the person gets into so again this uh, is uh, dependent also on the on the surgeon because some surgeons can can do three level surgeries quite easily because uh, they are used to doing it and they don't spend like 4 5 hours in the anterior part of the neck they can do every level say half an hour or 45 minutes and and finish the surgery in 3 hours so if you can do that then maybe anterior is okay but if you are going to do a 5 hour or 6 hour three level anterior uh, surgery then that's a complete no no because you are you are going to cause a lot of problems post operatively to the patient so morbidity is higher in anterior procedures especially if they are multi level whereas multi level procedures posterior the morbidity is is much lesser and it's much shorter surgery and it's better tolerated by the patients so the indications for anterior surgery is if you have a focal anterior pathology <clears throat> especially most of the time soft disc herniations are focal that means single level it is fewer than three levels and this is kind of with an asterisk for some people it is two level is few for some people three is few but for most people four is a, a, a anterior four level most people would not like to do but three is also sometimes most people would not choose to do a three level anterior um and and kyphosis because uh, you know as we discuss posterior surgeries for kyphosis are are not always effective because of spinal cord does not move away uh, from the anterior compression so the anterior surgeries are acdf and corpectomies now one level stenosis is usually an acdf surgery because you have a compression at one single level uh, uh this is a soft disc herniation you can see how gray this uh disc appears not like that opll that we saw in the previous scans and this patient gets an a single level acdf and there are various variations of a single level acdf you can do a single ac single level acdf with uh, without any plate you can do it with a single level cage without any plate so different ways of doing a single level acdf with a plate without a plate with a with a fixation device or without a fixation device or a stand alone cage or a stand alone graft most of the time um, with autografts and in non smokers um, this is a this has a very very high fusion rate so one level acdfs are usually not a problem two level acdf two level compressions can be either a two level acdf or a one level corpectomy so these are the two options available for two level stenosis for a two level stenosis usually we try to do a two level acdf uh, uh, because this is a very stable construct you can get six screws in the vertebral bodies usually these grafts don't kick out they are very stable and and doing acdfs kind of maintain the lordosis as well which is not so much as with a corpectomy but the problem here is that you have four fusion surfaces 1 2 3 4 and rarely can is usually not a problem for a two level uh, but a three level anterior can be a problem with with non union especially if the patient is a smoker and a diabetic uh, 
and an osteoporotic bone and you are using allograft instead of autograft so you still have to re also remember the fusion potential of a particular person when you are choosing surgeries as we discussed before but otherwise two level acdf is a perfectly uh, high uh, good result outcome surgery like in this patient we have done a two level acdf without a plate using uh, ilac crest graph autograph uh, so again works quite well in a otherwise healthy patient but if you have retro vertebral compression if the disc is migrating behind the vertebral bodies or if you have very collapsed disc or you have ossified uh, hard osteophytes or ossifications which which will be very difficult to remove through a narrow space like uh, like the disc uh, then you can always do a corpectomy and the advantage is that you have a you have fewer healing surface you have just one and two healing surfaces for a corpectomy and a one level corpectomy is a very pretty good construct unless the patient has osteoporosis and the screws don't hold uh, at all and usually you get a lot of autograft from the corpectomy that you have done so you don't have to dig into the ilac crest you can use the same autograft and put it in the cage and and use it for a one level acdf and this patient had a retro vertebral compression you can see the disc going behind the vertebral body so this patient gets an acdf this patient had a lot of collapsed disc and we were not able to distract these uh, disc spaces quite well so the area was quite narrow so we ended up doing a corpectomy for this patient and this is his post operative mri you can see the decompression but sometimes you do a corpectomy just to have more room for your decompression to make your acdf spacer uh, sorry safer so doing acdfs through narrow uh, space if you are not able to distract the disc space well especially if you have ossified disc or stuck uh, material to the dura then that's a problem you don't want to manipulate the spinal cord in any way possible three level stenosis as we discussed is uh, kind of controversial some people choose anterior some people choose posterior and there is nothing wrong or right in this uh, it in the end bottom bottoms down to two things one is surgeon's preference what the surgeon is comfortable with and the second is uh, will the patient tolerate a procedure or not depending on the comorbidities and uh, and the age of the patient so sometimes you choose a posterior just because uh, you have a lot of comorbidities and the patient will may not be able to tolerate a very long anterior procedure so three level stenosis to do a two level anterior corpectomy has uh, quite a significant graft extrusion rate about 10% uh um, and it's it, you can still do a two level corpectomy with an anterior plating and get away many times i have gotten away with it but uh, it's not something that i would try to do uh, unless i'm forced to do it i might choose a two level uh, uh, corpectomy but most of the time i am able to get uh, in Uh, it, it as either a three level acdf or a hybrid corpectomy and a discectomy so three level acdf again is a very good option very stable option the only problem here is that you have six fusion surfaces now so uh, so if 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 your patient is otherwise does not have a problem healing like a non smoker and all then you can use allografts and cages and all that's fine but if you have a smoker and diabetic and some other problems that you suspect will cause problem with fusion i don't hesitate to use autografts uh, in this patients especially if it is a three level acdf but most commonly if you have a three level i tend to use a hybrid construct like this combine an acdf with with a corpectomy and this is a very stable construct again you have you have six screws here in the anterior spine and the fusion surfaces you have reduced compared to what three level acdf is you get a lot of local autograft from the corpectomy that you have done so you don't have to dig into the ilac crest again so this is another this is the patient for whom we had done a combination uh, because the patient had a spondylolisthesis and a three level compression so this patient got a corpectomy or a hybrid corpectomy and a discectomy and now four level stenosis Uh, like this patient uh, i had this surgery done long time ago when i was much more brave in doing these surgeries and i did a four level is anterior surgery uh, this is a one level corpectomy and a two level acdf the, we did have plates that were long enough uh, 
so I have put a blocking screw for that last uh, uh, ACDF. You can see that blocking screw here. And this patient did go on to fuse very well and you know recover everything, but still had a stormy post-operative period because of the dysphagia and you know problems uh, swallowing and things like that. So anterior four-level surgery, and, and this was about 10, 12 years ago, and maybe that time I was not as fast or not as experienced as doing these anterior surgeries from the front. But if you ask me again for this, this kind of a, uh, anatomy, I would choose a posterior approach and not, not get into doing anterior uh, surgeries, at least as, as the first surgery for, the, for this patient. So uh, I've become wiser over a period of time, but multi-level anterior fusions have disadvantages of having dysphagia and airway problems and pseudoarthrosis if you have a multi-level ACDF and obviously graft extrusion if you do a long construct, uh, if it, especially if it's a corpectomy construct. Uh, dysphagia, again, elderly people, females, more than three levels, long duration surgeries. And that long duration is really important. You can't really do surgery for a very long time uh, in the anterior uh, part of the spine. Uh, airway obstructions and edema can be dangerous. Uh, they can land up in reintubations. And, and this patient, actually, I remember we lost this patient. Uh, I was a fellow then. This patient had a huge hematoma. Actually, it was this patient, not the previous one. Had a huge hematoma uh, anteriorly, and the patient became dysnic on the floor. Uh, and we had to open the wound uh, immediately on the floor and and then take the patient to the OR. But this patient was quite elderly and eventually did not survive. Uh, so it can be a risky thing, these multi-level anterior, especially in the elderly. And obviously pseudoarthrosis uh, is, is a problem uh, for anteriors, multi-level. Graph extrusion, definitely for a three-level AC, three-level corpectomies, uh, you, I would never leave them without a posterior uh, instrumentation. So, uh, a uh, two-level uh, corpectomy, I may choose not to do a posterior depending the, depending the quality of my construct and the fixation points and how good my screws were. But a three-level uh, corpectomy, even in healthy bone, I will do, I'm going to do an anterior posterior for that person because the failure rate of a three-level corpectomy is just too high. So posterior surgery has an advantage of having less surgical effort. You can avoid fusions, especially if you're doing laminoplasties. And in general, has a better complication profile uh, than uh, multi-level anterior decompressions. But posterior decompressions are usually done for three or more level. Uh, those people who have developmentally narrow canals. OPLLs are an exception. Uh, because even one level or two level anterior OPLL is a difficult surgery to do. So many people would choose a posterior for an OPLL. Obviously, posterior compressions are posterior decompressions. Previous anterior surgery and anterior approach, you may choose not to go anteriorly again and dissect that area and do a posterior surgery instead. Elderly people with comorbidities where you want to do a quick surgery, and not get into multi-level anteriors, uh, again, can be chosen posteriorly. But the requirement is that you need to have a lordotic or at least straight cervical spine if you are doing laminoplasties. You should not do laminectomies in straight cervical spines, but it requires a lordotic cervical spine. Posterior cervical decompressions, it's contraindicated in patients who have kyphosis, especially if that is fixed. It as doesn't change in flexion and extension. If you have a hill shape OPLL or you have a very severe compression of the spinal cord, then posterior surgery, it's not a contraindication, it's a relative contraindication because you can still do posterior, but the effectiveness of your decompression may not be uh, as much as an anterior surgery where you can stage your anterior surgery and do a second stage anterior once you have get a, gotten the cord to move back a little bit. And I would recommend all of you to read this uh, article by Dr. Bhojraj, and I think it is in Asian Spine Journal. and uh, gives a, a very good overview of where you can do posterior surgeries and the different patterns of compression where this is possible. But 
the posterior surgery types are laminectomy, laminoplasties, and laminectomy with fusion. Laminectomy is uh, is a uh, effective operation, but <clears throat> but it 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 can land up uh, in post laminectomy kyphosis and problems, especially if laminectomy is done for young patients. So doing laminectomy in 40 year olds and 50 year olds who are going to live for 30 or 40 years uh, can potentially be prob problematic. Not every patient who has uh, post laminectomy kyphosis would get symptomatic, but most studies have shown that over a period of time, uh, the results of laminectomy deteriorate. And the reason for that is imagine uh, uh, the, the, the spinal cord like a rubber band, like this rubber band here. So in a, in a lordotic position, this is how the rubber band is and you can see how the dots are. So you mark the dots here uh, on the spinal cord and when, when the cervical spine, hello, I'm just going to end in like five minutes. These are last few slides. So if, if when the cervical spine goes into kyphosis, you can see the distance between the dots is increasing. So you can imagine what is happening to the spinal cord when the, the spine gets formed and goes into kyphosis, the spinal cord gets stretched like a rubber band over it, it lengthens. And, and any lengthening is very poorly tolerated. And along with it, people have said that you can get post-laminectomy membranes like this that can compress the spinal cord and the kyphosis and the bowstringing effect of the uh, spinal cord on it. But, but this takes a really long time to develop. On an average, for late deteriorations to happen, for la post laminectomy, it takes anything between 10 to 15 years. On an average, most studies have shown 8 to 14 years. So, you know, saying that you have done laminectomy and the patient is fine at two years or five years or even 10 years is, is not good enough because uh, doing laminectomy in younger people who are going to live another 40 years is a problem because you don't know what is going to be there in store for them as their spines regenerate, right? Uh, so essentially laminectomies are usually not done for younger people. So this is how you can see how the splaying occurs of the, uh, of the paraspinal muscles, which is a very important tension band uh, uh, in, in the posterior cervical spine. This is a 70 uh, year old male patient post laminectomy kyphosis and post laminectomy kyphosis uh, after about 15 years of, uh, of surgery. So this patient had, uh, sorry, 20 years of surgery. I think this patient is from KEM when I was a lecturer there. This patient was operated 15, 20 years back with a laminectomy for an OPLL and ended up having a post laminectomy kyphosis and also development of new OPLL at the adjacent segment. Uh, and ended up having, uh, again, posterior surgery only, but with pedicle screws to correct the uh, kyphosis and having an indirect decompression. So laminectomy is useful for the elderly who are not going to live very long, who have comorbidities, who are not going to live very long, essentially have a degenerated cervical spine and a stiff spine. They have no instability. They have a lordotic cervical spine. And, and essentially not for patients with multi-root radiculopathy. Because you have myeloradiculopathies and if you're going to do foraminotomies at multiple level along with laminectomy, then that is further destabilizing because every foraminotomy will involve removing at least 50% of the facet joint at that, at that level. So um, the indications for laminectomy are usually the elderly or the comorbid patients uh, whom you want to do quick in and quick out surgery and not get into these uh, prolonged affairs. <clears throat> so this is an 80 year old patient, diabetic, hypertensive, post CABG. Actually, this is a central cord syndrome. So this patient got a, got a, a laminectomy. Uh, then on the second surgery is laminoplasty. <clears throat> so laminoplasty involves making a hinge and preserving the posterior elements so that your muscles and the ligament and nuclei and the ligaments have a place for them to get reattached and preserves the tension band of the cervical spine. <clears throat> this is how a laminoplasty looks like. You keep the lamina open with small mini plates uh, uh, or you can do a French door uh, 
instead of an open door so various different types and essentially you can do this for younger patients even you can do this for mildly kyphotic patients uh, and you can do it for smokers with non union risk where you don't want to do fusion surgeries like a, a laminectomy with fusion so again that's a good procedure to do it's not that laminoplasties don't get post laminoplasty kyphosis or laminoplasties don't have problems in the future mm. but but according to the evidence that we have right now uh, laminoplasties probably are at a lesser risk than laminectomies so again uh, some people don't believe it and some people still do laminectomies uh, and they are fond of laminectomies even in younger people uh but again it depends on where you have trained and how you interpret uh, the literature and what your evidence is uh, evidence points to but contraindications definitely if you have a kyphosis that is more than 15 degrees and you have instabilities and some people say it's it's a relative contraindication uh, axial neck pain for laminoplasties it's a relative contraindication i still sometimes choose laminoplasties for patients who have axial neck pain um and it's not necessary that their neck pain will increase after laminoplasty so this is a patient with a laminoplasty uh this is another how the post operative x ray looks of a laminoplasty and laminectomy with fusion is a big operation among all these three operations it's a big operation has more complications definitely you can have you do it in younger people with if if you can get the kyphosis into lordosis like it's a flexible kyphosis then this is a surgery to choose if you have segmental instability axial pain and preferably the patient should not have a risk for non unions because <clears throat> uh these surgeries are have take longer time they are more blood loss at least 5 to 9% of patients have instrumented related complications and revision surgeries because of non union and screws being loose and pseudo arthrosis and adjacent segment degeneration and stuff like that so uh doing a laminectomy with fusion for a young person is a morbid operation um no 40 year old or a 50 year old would like to have their neck completely fused and stiff because it is a it's quite a significant disability to have a c3 to c7 fusion so i think everybody should understand that uh, that the, the there is a big difference between motion preservation in the cervical spine and fusion uh, and many people given an option would choose motion preservation over fusion uh, especially the younger lot so this is a example of laminectomy with fusion this is another example 78 year old with a flexible kyphosis you can see the spine is kyphotic uh and has multiple level compression 78 year old but in on extension it is reducing to certain extent so this is how the extension uh, this is how the intraoperative images are so that you instrument it and you are forcefully correcting this with your instrumentation uh, and that's why you are going to c2 and having pedicle screws at the bottom so that's the correction that we have got with just posterior and avoiding an anterior a uh, procedure in a patient with a kyphotic uh, cervical spine so this you can do that an anterior posterior uh, surgery is required for patients with fixed kyphosis where where you think you are not going to get a correction from posterior approach patients with with post laminectomy kyphosis or patients with high risk of non union or osteoporosis get an anterior posterior procedure so this patient is an example of a post laminectomy kyphosis and a post laminectomy syndrome and progressive kyphosis you can see flexion extension x rays uh, it's not correcting fully and the anterior part of the cervical spine is stiff you have osteophytes so you know if you do your usual instrumentation you may not get uh, a good correction plus you don't have any much posterior surface to do your fusion except for the lateral masses so not only you are doing an anterior release and a posterior a uh, correction to correct the deformity but you are doing an anterior to do the fusion as well so this patient gets a multi level acdf and then a posterior approach so it, to conclude there is for surgery wise there is no single surgical technique that can best treat all types of pathology for cervical spondylotic myelopathy and any surgeon who offers only one procedure is not providing the highest level of care because 
you cannot just do one procedure for these uh, for these approaches so some people call themselves as anterior surgeons i'll do anterior no matter what or some people say i'll do posterior no matter what that's not the right way to approach these problems there are some so you have to be selective and individualize these patients to give the best results so thank you very much